So hello again and welcome to week three of our journey through the book of Acts. Conversational with a cup of coffee and open Bible. And this week, Nina and I are joined by a very special guest, Major Estelle Blake. You will remember Estelle, many of you, from her time with us when she spoke at our social justice conference. How long ago was that now? Two years? Two years ago? Um, and at the time, Estelle was in Italy. So hello, welcome Estelle, and tell us where are you now and what are you doing? I am no longer in Italy. I am now in, um, I live in Manchester, but I help to run the church over in Oldham, Fitton Hill. It's literally on top of a hill. Um, and it's very windy at times and has a different weather climate. But I am also 50% um, there, the church leader, and the other 50% I am the Anti-Trafficking and Modern Slavery Unit's Territorial Chaplain, which is a fancy word. It is. That's a very long name, isn't it? You enjoy it? Yes. Um, I love both. Both are, are great and um, very, very different, but in so many ways, very, very similar. And uh, how are you coping with lockdown? I'm doing okay, actually. Personally, I am quite chilled and relaxed about things but then that's because I'm out um two three days a week with Fit and Hill we have um activities within the estate that we're doing like singing and um playing games and doing community singing so and all the other things and well-being packs so yeah when I get home I'm quite happy to be home well, we're glad you're with us, and it's, it's, it's good to see you. We're actually recording this on Zoom, um, people. You won't get to see the video, but you'll certainly hear the audio recording. We're looking forward to a good conversation. We're looking at Acts chapter 2. So if you haven't taken time to read through Acts chapter 2, I ask you to pause and do that now, and then we'll get on with the conversation. Okay, so here we are. Acts chapter 2 begins with the coming of the Holy Spirit. Um, anyone want to start us off? Well, this, um, this coming of the Holy Spirit, we see there in verse 2, that it's described to us like the sound of a blowing wind um, coming down from heaven. And we have, we have an image there a straight away of the power of God coming at us uh, like a violent wind. And it has been suggested actually that um, it was more like a resemblance of a heavy rainstorm, this mighty invisible of God. And of course in the Hebrew, uh, the word for wind is ruach, that breath or wind of God. And in the Old Testament, ruach, is actually um, referred to as the Spirit of God. So even there in the Old Testament, right at the very beginning, when God breathed into Adam, you had the Ruach of God breathing into Adam, giving him new life, an indication right there, the Holy Spirit right at the beginning, breathing into man. And now we've got the indication here in Acts chapter 2 that that Ruach of God, the breath of God, the Holy Spirit is now being breathed into man again, giving him new power through the Holy Spirit. Like a new creation. Mm. Mm. I think it, it reminds me of that vision um, from Ezekiel with the, the bones being knitted together and that breath being breathed into that new person and into that, to that new body. And I find it intriguing, I think you talked about it and you mentioned it yourselves, that they were all together in one place when it happened. Yes. Which, in some ways in my head, makes no sense. Because if you were scared, wouldn't you want to be separated and be in different places so that you were less likely to all be found? Yeah. Um, but instead they were, they were together. And it's intriguing how sometimes believers are either always together for security and we find that sense together, and that newness comes maybe because we've all had a shared experience, like we are a bit now, we're having that shared experience. Yeah, mm. brilliant. That's, um, that's Ezekiel 37, isn't it? Yeah. Everyone wants to look that up, yeah. Ezekiel 37, new life coming in. It's interesting, really, because Jesus in John 3, when he was talking to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, 
talked about the uh, Nicodemus. Let's just invent let's, a new game. Invent new characters, shall we, in the Bible? Nicodemus. <laughs> no, Nicodemus. Jesus speaking to Nicodemus, and uh, he talks about the Holy Spirit, the wind blowing yeah. where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it comes from. So it is with anyone born of the Spirit. The fact of the matter is, this coming of the Spirit, it wasn't something they could demand. It wasn't sort of, you know, you pay your money and you just receive it. Um, it was something that God had promised through Jesus, and they were yeah. now waiting. It was a gift that was coming, yeah. but it was not on their terms. It's mm. always on God's terms. The Spirit is given on God's terms. And, and Neil and I had a, a, a story, heard a story this week about a young man who simply made a prayer in his bedroom, Lord, I am yours, use me. And the moment he prayed that, the Spirit of God came yeah. and filled him. Um, because he gave him permission, he gave God permission, and it's always on God's terms, which is that of surrender. So that's really good. I just want to remind people listening that Pentecost is actually the celebration of harvest within the Jewish calendar. And it was 50 days after um, uh, Passover. And so what we have here is a celebration of the first fruits, if you like, of the harvest. But with the coming of the Spirit, Pentecost takes on a whole new meaning because we celebrate the harvest of souls and these, these believers are the first fruit of the church. The yeah. church is born this day. This is the church's birthday. And um, in that sense, it's, it's obviously a very significant time for us to celebrate. And of course, you will be listening to this the Wednesday or the week after um, Pentecost itself. So we're in that time of Pentecost as we celebrate um, the uh, coming of the Holy Spirit. Mm. Anyone else? Well, it's interesting because um, when Jesus breathed on those disciples to receive the Holy Spirit, it was also an experience of God's love for each one of them. Um, it wasn't just the Holy Spirit that, that they were being given. It was that experience of love that was being breathed into them. It was another gift that God had to give to those disciples. You know, um, Back in John 15, I think it was, um, Jesus was saying, wait for the gift that is going to come to you, my, my promised yes. Holy Spirit. And of course, the disciples at that point didn't even have a clue yes. what Jesus was talking about exactly. in terms of the Holy Spirit. And yet here in Acts, Jesus is saying, now is my time to go, but I'm not going to leave you by yourself. I'm going to give you that promised Holy Spirit that I had talked about. So now I'm going to leave you with this gift of further love. And that love is through the gift of the Holy Spirit. Rick Warren um, says that to feel loved by God is the starting point for every ministry, every revival, every renewal, every great awakening. And of course, we know that in every ministry, revival, renewal, great awakening is the Holy Spirit that provides the power for all of those things. So God is saying that to be loved, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit to have that revival, have that awakening, have that um, great ministry, receive the Holy Spirit to have that great thing. The other side of that is God is saying, I love you this much that I want to give you the Holy Spirit to experience yeah. all of those things. Yeah. I think, I was going to say, I think it's quite intriguing that they seemed, um, <laughs> they seemed, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated. Now, it's intriguing that fire is seen as a purifying thing, really. We yes. talk about the harvest, the, you talk about the harvest and the Pentecost. Fire is something that is often used to purify the earth and to burn the chaff and burn what's left behind yes. so that there is a, a new ground, so the ground will get new life. Yeah. And, that, and although we have this image, don't we, of like fire on everybody's head, it would have been a purification thing, which would have gone back to their, their understanding and imagery of sacrifice and would have taken them. And that whole idea that they would understand and they were all given the gift and they could speak in other tongues as the spirit enabled them. The only time I, now, when we talk about speaking in tongues, we, we speak about a different language we don't understand. And the reality is that my mum said she prayed that God's spirit, when I first went to Italy in 96, she prayed God's spirit would fall upon me 
and that I would have the gift of tongues to speak in Italian. In all the time I went, and I've been in Italy, I've never had a translator to, to interpret and to translate my messages. It was only me. And some of the most intriguing times was, I remember specifically, I was in Naples, and I'd been in Italy maybe two and a half years. And um, somebody asked me a question, and I opened up the Word of God, and I preached. And I have absolutely no memory of the sermon, no memory of what I said. I know the subject matter, but I don't remember any of the con any of it. But she said it's the best sermon she'd ever heard. Wow! And she said my Italian was perfect. Now Italian grammar is notoriously difficult, and um, she said it. And she was a uh, somebody who loved the language and had been made to study it perfectly. And my mum, and I remember telling my mum about it, and she said, "But that's the spirit. Why? It's if it's a language you don't understand, God will use it, and it's you being used by the spirit." And that really is my only memory. I know that when I speak, and I speak, I don't think I speak fluently, but I do. But I think that God will use that time and will use your your knowledge. And also something I would say he uses you wanting to give your time to him and the discipline you give. And then he blesses that. So that young guy leaning down saying, God, I'm ready. And God's saying, well, here's my spirit. Let's get on with it. Yeah, totally. yeah. I liked what you said as well about um, the, the, the tongues of fire, this sense of burning up as well, Estelle. You know, when we went to South Africa, we came to um, parts of the bush where all the trees and all the land had been completely wiped out by fire. And as we were speaking to the game ranger, whatever they're called, um, he was saying, oh no, we start these fires deliberately because what happens is we actually clear the land so there can be new growth and, and new shoots. And of course, when you think of bushfires, you think of what you hear in Australia and all that's going on there. You can't think about somebody who's deliberately starting a fire for there to be new yeah, life that was intentional. And, it was intentional. and and here you have god intentionally giving us this tongues of fire to start not only to burn up what is the dross and is 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 in our way of preventing us going forward with christ but actually yeah. Burn, intentionally burning a fire within us to give us passion to do the things that he has called and asked us to do. And I think what is really helpful for us to remember in that analogy is going back to South Africa, the burning was always intentional, but it was always limited. It never got out of control. Mm. It did not yeah. bring damage. And in the same way, when the Spirit of God comes, he burns up the chaff, as Estelle said, it is intentional, it yeah. is deliberate. Yeah um but it does not damage it brings life um and that's really helpful and of course the, the the song we sing at pentecost the founder wrote um god of burning cleansing flame send the fire there is that sense of the fire is fire we want the fire we need yeah you know the, the fire to burn up sin this is a positive fire um this is a good fire and interestingly enough i read somewhere uh, the idea of the tongues of fire, whether they were physical or not, would have been reminiscent of the burning bush. Wow. This fire, mm. this bush was burning, but it actually wasn't on fire. It wasn't destroying the bush. Mm. So the fire of God brings life, um, attracts attention, demands attention as we see as we read on in acts 2 and it burns up within us that which stops us from being the witnesses god wants us to be and it stops us from um well it deals with those things within our own lives that need sorting um, anything that gets in the way of us being fully open to I come back to the story of that young man. Here I am, use me. God loves people who surrender to him. Yeah. It, it's, I think it's like, a, if I can use this, this phrase, it's like a moth to a flame. It's people say, here I am, I surrender. He is there. He loves it. He delights in it. Yeah. And uh, I think the other thing to say as well about the whole idea of, of the Holy Spirit 
and love is we do have these verses in Ephesians 3 where Paul writes at the end of Ephesians 3 praying that people would come to understand the love of God, the love of Christ that's beyond knowledge, so they may be filled with the fullness of God. He's talking about being strengthened through his spirit. You read that in Ephesians chapter 3, it's his prayer there, 14 to 19. But there is the link. Uh, very much so, that as Christ dwells in our hearts through the Spirit, when we're rooted and grounded in love, we begin to understand more and more what it means to, to, to experience the fullness of God. God is love. Yeah. You know, yeah. God is love. And I, I think there's a really intriguing thing there because we, we think that because now we're reading it and um, it's funny, somebody always says to me, what, how do you understand it? Can you understand it? And I was reading this again the other day in preparation for today and also because I've been thinking about Ascension and Pentecost and the whole thing. And in verse 6 and then again in verse 11 and 12, there are these words that are incredible. They were utterly amazed. They were together in bewilderment. Now this is the NIV. And then it goes on to say, we hear them declaring the wonders of God amazed and perplexed they asked one another what does this mean not not what are they saying but that sense of amazement and and perplexity and bewilderment sometimes when we're christians who believe we think we should understand everything that god is doing straight away yes. and yet these were not non-believers but also the disciples that sense of amazement and bewilderment and they were like really we're seeing these tongues, it's happening, and what on earth? And that, that's the thing, that sometimes we want answers, but we can't always get them. Yeah. We, we don't know why. It's like somebody once said to me, maybe God just wants you to say yes to go to Italy. And I went, okay, I'll say yes. And then I'll never forget that I was like, right, now I'm getting on a plane. All, I did, all, all you told me God wanted was to say yes. And I've been back, <laughs> you yeah. know, it's not, so it's like sometimes saying yes, will take you on to something else. And you're like, but why did I, well, I just said yes. 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 And sometimes that yes can bring the absolute utter amazement and the perplexity that says, why would you use someone like me, Lord? I've no GCSEs or O levels. I've I've no great education. Why would you use me in that amazement and that perplexity? But the other great thing about that, Estelle, is there a um, a, a three letter word in both um, verse three and four that the Holy Spirit separated and came to rest on all of them. Yeah. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. It wasn't just one or two that was chosen. And that's the amazing thing that God's Spirit, God's Holy Spirit, is there for all yeah. if they do what that young lad did, got down on his knees and surrendered and said, use me. It's the yes. It's the yes that Estelle talked about. And here we have, uh, I'm using the New Revised Standard Version here, Verse 4, all of them were filled with the Spirit, began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them ability. The fact is, it's the Spirit who gives us the ability yeah. when we say the yes. So when Jesus said at the beginning of Acts, you will be my witnesses, uh, but wait for the power, the, the call of Jesus, he never calls us to do something without giving us the power. So when he called Estelle went to Italy, she gave her yes, he gave her the power and the ability. Mm. And um, I think the challenge for all of us is to keep saying yes to God, because it's very easy to say yes to God and then to say, well, I've said my yes. I don't need to listen to whether God is asking anything else of me. And yet we're always called to continue to grow and to experience more of God. Paul talks about go on being filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So if saying yes to God is a key to receiving the gift of the spirit then our daily life and our daily prayer life should be yes Lord. yes Lord. yes Lord. yes yes you know imagine if you for a week said my only prayers my only prayer every moment of every day is going to be yes Lord. it's surrender yes Lord. yes Lord. i wonder what would happen in our lives if that became our prayer 
and you made that art correct. Mm. That's challenging. I think it's challenging. Mm. So. Yeah, there's the um, there's the old um, well, it's not an old chorus. It's like that song that says, I can't remember it, and I'm not going to sing it. I oh, did sing on. to them. I did sing to Simon and Nina the other week, but I'm not going to now. Um, mm. And it says, oh. Yes to your will, Lord, and your will alone. Yes. No to I, my... I was thinking of that song as actually earlier. Uh, I want to say yes to the Lord of my life. Is that the one? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I want to say yes to the Lord. Oh, yeah, this is, this is a Bible podcast. Not right, a music so it's pod. not great. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's that's probably a, a good place to finish this part of yeah. our conversation, yeah, actually. It's a challenge there, the challenge yeah. to say yes and the challenge to everyone listening. We, we've been setting homework. And so the homework, if you like, for this next week is to make part of your daily prayer, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. And actually to ask the Spirit to show you if there's areas in your life where you have been resisting him, either been metaphorically walking around with hands over your ears, trying not to listen, or have been saying, no, no, God, or I, not yet, God, you know. Um, that willingness that says, use me, Lord, use me, and in fact, I just think of Isaiah 6, and I better check this because I want to make sure that what I'm going to say is right. Otherwise, um, I will be giving false information. But when Isaiah had the vision, um, he said, here I am, Lord. Um, and his lips were cleansed and he was cleansed. And then God sent him to the people. After he said, here I am, then God gave him his calling. And he was touched with another burning coal. Yes, yes, the fire again. There was more fire again. Because the coal was on fire, his lips weren't singed. No. He didn't then go say, I lived for weeks with burning. So, you know, as we live in the light of Pentecost, let's say, Lord, burn up everything within me. Give me a passion. Give me a passion. Let your fire sort out the chaff. Give me the ability to do what you call me to do. But my prayer is simply to say yes. Thank you, everybody. We shall see you next week.